Today's message is, are we using our time wisely? And we're going to be reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 20. So let's go there. This will be our opening scripture. Uh, this is the scripture the Lord placed in my heart this morning. And so the message um, that God has placed in my heart is surrounding um, what I read in this chapter this morning. So in the Gospel, according to St. Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 16, and uh, we'll read through the verses and then we'll come back and we'll elaborate as God give it to us. Again, we're focusing on, are we using our time wisely? This chapter has to do with how we're using our time. Are we using it for the glory of God or are we just using it uh, unwisely and just thinking that the time that we have is our time to do whatever we want to do with it? All right, so let's see what it says in uh, Matthew's gospel, chapter 20. Verse number one says, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. So underline standing idle. They were standing idle. He went out about the third hour again, all right, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And the third hour would be uh, nine o'clock. The first hour is six o'clock in the morning. So when the Bible talks about third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, uh, you know exactly what time they were talking about. So first hour is six in the morning. Third hour is nine o'clock. Sixth hour would be 12, et cetera. So he went back out around the third hour. He saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Verse four, he said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And again, he went out about the sixth hour. So we know that's 12 o'clock. And the ninth hour at three o'clock and did likewise. And about the 11th hour, about five o'clock, Right at 11 hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, why stand ye here all day idle? So notice a lot of people are in the marketplace, but they're idle, all right? They're not doing anything, all right? And he goes back and he says to them, why stand ye here all day idle? That was the end of verse six. They said unto him, because no man hath hired us, Underline, no man have hired us. Jesus asked them, why are you standing here idle? They said, nobody hired us. All right, so it tells me that there are some people who are looking for others to hire them. All right, that could be the mindset of some people that are looking you know, for a job. They hope to find a good job one day. All right, but we have to change the way we think. We want to be the householder that was in the beginning of the first verse, the one who owns everything. So instead of thinking about looking for a job, we should be thinking about creating a job. But then we realize that there are some people who had that mindset of, we need somebody to hire us. So remember, that was their response. Let me go back to that. I believe that was verse seven. And he said unto them, because no man have hired us, he said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. Verse eight. And when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto the steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. So call the workers in and we're going to pay them starting with the last person that we hired and we're going to do it backwards. All right. And then we're going to pay the person who we hired first. We're going to pay him last. Continue to read. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny because they worked longer. So they expected to get more than the people who were hired at the 11th hour. The person who I hired at the beginning of the day was expecting to make more money. Verse 11. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. 
But he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Did it not the agree with me for a penny? Take that as thine and go thy way. And I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. So he said, I made an agreement with you of what I'm going to pay you when I hired you in the beginning. I paid, I promised that I would pay you a penny a day. Let's continue. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last for many be called, but few chosen. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last for many be called, but few are chosen. There was a lot that was said in this chapter. We're not going to be able to break everything down in one uh, teaching, but we're going to cover what God has placed in our heart concerning using our time wisely. Time is the commodity. It's the one commodity that we all have been given. So the question now becomes, how are we using our time? Time is the one commodity we all have. How you choose to use it is up to you. All right, so again, we've all been given time here on planet Earth. But how you choose to use your time on planet Earth is up to you. Now, God is not going to make us or anybody, believers or non-believers, do anything. Everything that we do in life is by choice, is by our free will. If God would make us, and he could if he wanted to, but the reason why God doesn't make people do anything with their time or with their life is a choice that you have to make is because you are made in the image and likeness of God. You are made in the image of God, which means you are spirit like God. If you saw an image of God, you would see a spirit because the Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you're made in the image and you are like God. One of the definitions I give when I talk about likeness, that God is three in one, that means we are also three in one, but there are other ways that we are like God. Another way in which we are like God, God is sovereign, which means God has a free will. He can do whatever he pleases, and nobody can order God and tell God what he should do. You know, who can get into the mind of God that he may instruct him, the scripture says. No one can instruct God what to do. He's sovereign. He does as he please. So since we are like God, that means we have the ability to do as we please. But you must understand with every decision that we make, there are either rewards or consequences. And that's the danger of having a free will. That is the danger of having a free will, especially if you have not been taught in the things of God at a young age. See, when you're instructed and, and trained in the things of God at a young age, you learn to submit your will to God, just as Jesus did and said on many occasions, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. This is something that you have to learn as a child in scriptures, that we must learn how to submit our will to God, even though he's given us the ability to choose and make choices. But he also left in his word different stories to let us know that when we make bad choices, there will be consequences. And we see that early in the Bible when you read in the book of Genesis, when you look at the story of Adam and Eve. That was really a story about making choices and obeying God. God gave a commandment. You could eat freely from every tree, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the consequences will be, if you eat, you shall die. So we know the story. They, they, and again, the scripture doesn't tell us how long they had the opportunity to enjoy the, the garden before Adam and Eve ate from the tree that God told them not to. So they could have lived in the garden for hundreds of years because remember, there was no such thing as time. Time did not go into play until Adam disobeyed God. Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden. So we see now they experience the consequence of their disobedience to God's commandment. So again, this is one of the um, danger of having a free will. God wants us to choose to serve him. He wants us to choose to love him. This is a choice that you have to make. And if you choose not to do that, know that there are going to be consequences. 
The consequences may not come now, but they will come at some point. Because the scripture says, uh, in, I believe it's in Galatians, I believe it's around uh, maybe chapter 6, I think it is. It says, God is not Mark. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So in other words, you can't mock God. You can't say, well, that's not going to happen. You know, I can do whatever I want. It's not going to come back to me. You know, the world has this saying, what goes around comes around. That's the same thing. It's that, that's saying whatever a man sow it is what he's, he's going to reap. That's just the world way of saying it. So the Bible says you can't mock God. And the way you mock God is saying, that's not true. That's not going to happen. You know, I can do anything I want. I can do people wrong, and it's not going to come back to me. The Bible says you can't mock God. If God said that's what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. It may not happen now. It may not happen tomorrow. But believe me, just as sure as you're where you are listening to this message, God says, whatsoever a man soweth, that is what he shall reap. So whatever you have sown in your life, you're going to reap it. What have you, whatever you've sown in other people's life, you're going to reap it. You find that scripture in Galatians 6. So let's just hold our place and we can look at some scriptures. So write these scriptures down. Because remember, I tell you, I'm just flowing as the Holy Spirit give it to me. And um, you write the scripture down and you'll have it, you know, for your own future cross-reference and to study it out. Let's go to Galatians real quick. Gal Galatians chapter number six. So you can't mock God. God said, whatever a man sow is what he's going to reap. And most of the time when we think about sowing and reaping, we think about uh, seeds in the natural. We think about giving into God's kingdom. We think about when we sow money into people's life. All of that is a part of sowing. All right. But there are other ways that we sow too. In Galatians chapter number six, Look at verse number seven. Matter of fact, just to make sure we're in, explain it in context with the chapter, uh, let's go back. And remember I told you it's important that we should have been taught in our younger age that we need to learn to submit our will to God. You know, the Bible even tells us that we're not even supposed to do anything unless we say, if it be the Lord's will, we'll do thus and so on tomorrow. If God will tarry, we're going to do thus and so. We can't even make plans without invoking God first. That's what the Bible says in the book of James. So if we make plans, we must first say, if it's the Lord will, we will do thus and so on tomorrow. So you learn that in scripture. You learn that in Sunday school. You learn that through your parents teaching you the things of God. If your parents are uh, children of God who have delighted themselves in the things of God, that they will instruct you in these things. So notice how this verse begins now. So this is why I want to go back and show you. Look at verse six. It says, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So again, Paul is saying here, let him who is taught in the word. So we need to be taught in the word. And then we take what we have been taught and we communicate to others. We communicate to our teachers. We, we um, have conversation concerning the scriptures with our teachers, those who are instructing us and those who are teaching us. It could be your parents, it could be your pastor, it could be your teacher in the, in the Sunday school. So the Bible says we commune with them, we communicate with them based on what we have been taught. Now look at verse number seven. It says, but be not deceived, God is not mock. For whatsoever a man sow it, that, that is what he's gonna reap. So whatever you sow, that thing is what you're going to reap. So if you have sown evil, guess what you're going to reap? Evil. If you have sown hatred, guess what you're going to reap? Hatred is going to come back to you. And like I said before, it may not come now. It may not come tomorrow. It may not come the day after. But it's going to come because the Bible said you can't mock God. You can't tell God that doesn't work. Because that's mocking God. When you tell God, after he said something's going to happen or this is the way things are going to work and you say that can't work, then you're mocking God. God cannot be mocked. Whatever God says is going to come to pass. So whatever a man saw it, the Bible says that, that thing is what he's going to reap. And so we have to be careful of what we sow in our life and what we do with our time. However we use our time, what we have sown during that time, 
that is what's going to come back to us. So if we expect good, then we must sow good. If we expect others to be a blessing to us, then we must be a blessing. Whatever you do comes back to you. Okay, so again, it says, we cannot mock God, whatever a man sow it, that shall he also reap. So again, we have a free will to serve God or choose not to. But again, I say, if we choose not to, know that we're going to reap because we were placed here for a reason. We were placed here with a purpose and we were placed here by God. And we are given choices and he expects us to make good choices. All right, so now, as I said before, time is the one commodity that we all have. How we choose to use it, it is up to us. As I was looking through the scripture, and I think about time being that commodity that we're all given, that once we use it, and once it's gone, we can't get it back. Unless it is given back to us supernaturally. That's the only way you can recover lost time. But whatever time we have used, and however we've used our time in the past, we cannot get that time back. We can't get yesterday back. Yesterday is gone. We can't even get the time back that we use from today already up until this point. That time is gone. But there's one way in which we can have time restored that we've lost. There's only one way. I know many of us listening to this message today can kind of reflect on our life and look at the time that we use and the things that we've done with our time. And we wish we can go back and get some of that time back. You know, and I can give you a list of things you know, and you probably can give me a list of things in which you can go back in your life that you used up a whole lot of time that you wish you could get back. You know, time and relationship, time with people, you know, investing in people, investing in things, investing in business that did not work out the way you wanted it to work out. And we wish we can get that time back. Well, in the natural, we can't get that time back because once the time is used, it is gone. But there is hope. Thank God for covenant. Thank God for being in relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to recover lost time, and that is supernaturally by the power of God. So let's look at that really quickly. So again, we're going to move around through the scripture. Let's go to the book of Joel, chapter number two. And I'm reading still from uh, the King James Version of the Bible. Joel chapter number two. So remember, if we've lost time in the past and we look at all the time that we lost and we wish we can get that time back, God says, I'm the only one that can restore lost years. So there's no need of us crying over the time that we lost. We need to commit ourselves to God, submit and commit ourselves unto him who is able to restore the time that we lost. Amen. Amen. Well, let's look at Joel chapter number two. And again, write these scriptures down and, you know, go back to them and read them uh, during your convenient time. Chapter number two, look at verse number 25 through 27. Look what God says to the children of Israel. He says, I will restore to you the years. Underline that. God says, I will. I will. No one else can do this. I, the Lord, only can do this. Because there's only some things that only God can do, and there's some things that man can do. And God expects you to do what you have the ability to do. And he's going to do what he has the ability to do. And he has the ability to restore lost time. Isn't that beautiful? Glory to God. He says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. So notice this. Uh, it talks about the locusts. Now, all of these are locusts. He says, I will restore the years, but it says here that the locusts have eaten. It says the, the, the canker worm and the caterpillar. So a canker worm is a locust. A caterpillar is a locust. A palmer worm is a locust. 
And God said, this is my great army, which I send among you. God got a lot of different mighty armies. We know he got a mighty army of angels. And Jesus is the captain of the host, you know, of the host of the Lord, of the kingdom of, of the, the angels of God. Jesus is the captain. But God have a whole lot of different armies. He have armies of bugs. <laughs> Glory God. That can just wipe things out. And that's what locusts do. They wipe stuff out. They eat up everything. And God says, I sent my army of locusts. So these are just different types of locusts. And the reason why I mentioned like this, they got, these are some locusts that fly, some locusts that crawl, all right? Some locusts that hop, but they're all locusts. And they all do different things. They all can devour and, to de and destroy. And God said, this is my army I sent to devour, to destroy. So it says the locusts have, let me go back and read verse 25 again. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I send among you. So that means everything that happened, God knows is going to happen. And remember, God allows what we allow. And many times our behavior brings on God's judgment. Many times things that are happening in our world is a result of the behavior of mankind. A lot of times we want to blame things on God. No, it's not God. It's the result of our using our will, but not using it for the things of God, our behavior. And many things that we experience on the planet is because of the decision that men have made. Not thinking about the consequences of their decision, but just thinking about the instant gratification of that decision at the time. So let's continue to read verse number 26. And again, we're talking about the only person that can restore time and years is God Almighty. Awesome. Verse 26, and you shall eat plenty. So God said, I'm going to restore the years. And not only that, you're going to eat plenty. You're going to enjoy life. You're going to have more than enough. So he said, you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. That is beautiful. Are we God's people today? Are we experience a, uh, experiencing a crisis during our time? But God says to the children of Israel, I'm going to restore the years. And then he makes it clear, this is not only just for Israel, but it's for my people. And he says, my people, are we the people of God? Those of us who are born again, and have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into God's dear kingdom, the kingdom of his dear son? Are we his children? Then he's talking to us too. He's talking to the family of God. And he says, I will restore the years, family of God, that you have lost. And I love it at the latter part of verse uh, 26. He says, you will, or in the beginning, it says you will be satisfied. And then he says, you will praise the name of the Lord your God. God's going to restore you. So you need to start giving God some praise right now. Some of us have lost some things. Some of us have lost some family members during this time. We've lost our joy. Some of us have lost our peace. You know, I mean, the devil is hitting us from every side. But God says, I'm going to restore the years. Amen. That the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the canker worm, all these locusts have eaten. I'm going to restore those years unto you, say the Lord. And it says, you shall eat in plenty. Oh, family of God, I want you to have an expectation. Even in the midst of what we're still going through, you still got to have an expectation that God is going to be faithful to his word. And he promised that he's going to restore the years and you're going to eat in plenty. Can I get the church to say amen to that? That means you're going to have more than enough. You're going to have enough to be a blessing to you and your family and to bless others. Glory to God. This is what we've been praying for. We've been asking God to bless us to be a blessing. He said, you will eat it plenty and you will praise the name of the Lord. So I dare you to start giving God some praise. Even if you have not seen the full manifestation of what you're believing God for during this time. Because again, trials and tests and pestilence and all these things that we're seeing now, all of it is designed really to destroy your faith. To make you lose hope in the things of God. But I want you to know something. God got his people covered. We are still in the secret place of El Elyon. Hallelujah. The most high God. So you need to praise the name of your God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
You can praise him because you're still here. He's still providing for you. You still got your health and strength. You still got your family. You got your home. Yes, some may have been lost, but you're still here. You have something to give God praise for. So you ought to praise the name of the Lord that we are at the beginning of the year of restoration. Hallelujah. Glory. Because after every storm, the sun is going to shine. Oh, glory. We need to start seeing our way, amen, through the storm so that we can see the sun is about to break through these clouds and the things that are happening during our time. Keep hope alive. Keep your faith alive in God. So the Bible tells us here, praise the name of the Lord your God. He have dealt wondrously with us. And my people, you and I, shall never. And remember, I told you in a message, that word never is really reserved for God. God is the only one that can say something will never happen. Because you know when we say never, the thing that we say never will happen, wind up happening. So that word never is really reserved for God. And God says, I will never go back on my word. Guess what? He's the only one that will never go back on his word. So that word never is really reserved for God. I've learned that in my early years of my, of my life. Never say never. Never say what you're never going to do. Because that very thing that you say you're never going to do, you're going to wind up doing it. And God proved that to me. Son, that word never is only reserved for me. And people use it all the time. I'll never say that. I'll never do this. And they wind up doing it. But notice God says here, my people shall never be ashamed. Amen. Glory to God. Hold your head up high, family of God. We have nothing to be ashamed of. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Even if we've lost some things and lost some people, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Because what? They're in glory. Hallelujah. They're with the Lord. If we lost some things, those things can be replaced. Those things can be restored. Hallelujah. So we have nothing to be ashamed of. Yes, it's been difficult for a whole lot of people. Family of God. The family of God has been going through. Family of God struggling during this time. But you have nothing to be ashamed of. Hallelujah. God is with you. And he's going to see you through as long as you keep your faith in him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you shout hallelujah? And that's a good place right there to put an amen. Glory to God. You have nothing to be ashamed of. I don't care what you're going through, what you've experienced during this time. Even if you had to battle with keeping your peace and you lost your way for a moment, but as long as you got yourself together, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Hallelujah. You, you know the story. You know Peter missed it several times. And then Jesus had to say to him on one occasion, Peter, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith fail thee not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brother. So Jesus already knew that the devil was going to come against Peter, and Peter was going to fail three times. But Jesus said, I prayed for you. I prayed that your faith fail you not. Glory to God. So you might have lost your faith for a moment. You might have lost your peace for a moment during this time. But Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God praying for you so your faith will not fail you. Amen. Hallelujah. You. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, that my faith haven't failed. I still believe you. I still trust you. I might have wavered a little bit because of circumstances. But I still trust you and I believe you with all my whole heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I may have wavered a little bit, but it's okay. Jesus says, and, and notice what Jesus says to Peter. He says, now, after you've had your experience, he says, when you are converted, strengthen your brother. Once you've had your experience and you've gotten yourself together, then I want you to go and serve and strengthen your brother. How do you know Peter got it together? Yeah, he denied Christ. But Christ gave him an opportunity to, uh, the, to cancel out those denials when Jesus appeared to him and said, Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? And notice Jesus said that to him three times. Because remember, the scripture says, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You would do what I tell you to do, not deny me. So he had to remind Peter and gave Peter a chance to cancel out those denials. Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. 
Jesus said to him three times, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? The Bible says Peter was grieved that the Lord asked him three times. He said, Lord, you know I love you. Yeah, Peter, I know a lot of things about you. I know you said you wouldn't deny me earlier. But do you love me, Peter? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Then, Peter said, then the Lord says to Peter, go strengthen your brother. So if we missed it along the way and we got weak, but well, we've been restored, now we have a responsibility to go strengthen our brothers and sisters who may still be stuck in the storm, who still may be struggling through what we're going through at this time. Hallelujah. So we have a responsibility if God has brought us through and brought us out, then we have a responsibility to strengthen our brothers and sisters in the things of God. Isn't that beautiful? So God says here, my people will never be brought to shame. Ain't no shame in what we do. There's no shame. I love it. All right, I said I would read to verse number 27. So the latter part of verse 26 back in, um, in Joel, it says, my people, talking about the family of God, shall never be ashamed. Hold your head up, family of God. Hold your head up and keep looking to the hills. The Bible says, I shall lift up mine eyes to the hills. Then you ask yourself a question, from whence cometh my help? My help don't come from the hills, but my help come from the Lord. Glory to God. You got to know where your help come from. David said, I believe in Psalms 121, he says that I will lift my eyes to the hills. Well, if you live in the city, you can't lift your eyes to the hills. You lift your eyes up, you're going to see tall buildings. So that tells me your help don't come from the hills. You got to look at David's location when he said that. He wasn't in a, in a metropolis where there was a whole lot of tall buildings. He's in an open area where he can see trees and mountains. So the scripture is really saying, he says, I will lift up my eye to the, hill, but, to the hills, but then he asks himself a question. From whence cometh my help? So as he's looking to the hill, he's asking himself a question. My help comes from the Lord, not from the hills. God is our helper in the time of trouble. Amen. The Bible says in Psalms 46, he's a present help in the time of trouble. I know he's been there for you every step of the way, just like the footprints in the sand. You know the story. He's been with us every step of the way, even when we couldn't feel him and we couldn't see him. You know, one of the things I've learned in being on earth on my short period of time of being here, I've learned how to find the good in everything. I've learned how to find the silver lining in everything. Even during the time of pandemic, quarantine, the time that we're in, you gotta find the good in everything because something good can come out of everything, but you gotta look for it. And if you don't look for it, guess what? You're not gonna see it. All you're gonna see is what's before you. In every storm, something good can come out of it. I believe that. And I see it in the scripture. I have a proof of it from the scripture. I mean, I can use several scenarios. Even if you think about the scripture where Jesus told his disciples to go on the, in the ship and he said, I'll meet you. He said, we're going to the other side. You know the story, they got in the ship and they ran into a storm, but Jesus wasn't in the ship with them. And as they were in the ship, they saw the wave tossing, the wind was blowing. But then they see somebody, they see something coming, walking on the water. So that means they were looking in the storm. They were looking at something. They thought it was a ghost, but it was actually Jesus coming to them in the storm. But that tells me not only they were going through the storm, they were looking in the storm and they saw something. So you got to look through your storm and you got to find the good. You got to look for Jesus to come and rescue you in the midst of your storm. Then the Bible said, and to those who look for him, shall he appear the second time? So Jesus is coming back only for those who are expecting him and looking for him to come. If you're going through the storm now, you should be looking for Jesus to come and rescue you. Yeah, it may look blur. He may look like a blur. You may not recognize him, but I'm telling you, God moves in so many different ways, and sometimes it's hard for you to see the goodness of God when you're confronted with so many things around you at the same time. But God's goodness is forever present. You got to learn how to find it. You got to look for it. You got to find the good in everything. You know why? God is good all the time. And God can bring, because anytime God show up, that's goodness. Because God is good. He brings goodness with him every, every time he shows up. So if you're in the midst of a situation and God show up, guess what? That's goodness. 
So you got to find goodness and you got to find good and the silver lining in every storm. Because I believe the word of God, that God will show up to you in the midst of a storm. And you know what? That story, that's a, that's a whole beautiful, fascinating story. I mean, there's so much to glean from that story of the disciples being in the ship. One thing I want to point out, when the Bible said they looked out at the storm and they saw somebody coming, they thought it was a ghost. And the Bible said they cried out for fear. They were afraid. And remember, fear stifles us. Fear keeps us from going forward and receiving from God the things that God has in store for us. But one of the things that's fascinating about that story, with all the disciples being in the ship, only one person asked to come out and walk on the water. They recognized it was Jesus. At some point, they all recognized that it was Jesus. But only Peter said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come. And Jesus held out his hand and said, come. And even in the midst of the storm, Peter stepped out on the water and he walked on water. Everybody in the ship had the opportunity to do it, but only one person chose to do it. Now, it's okay even if you follow the leader. Somebody should at least follow Peter. Say, man, if Peter can do it, I should be able to do that too. Who else is going to be? Who, who are, what other Peters that we have listening to me this morning? that's willing to take a step of faith and trust God and believe God in the midst of your storm, that he's going to show up and that you'll be able to walk on water above your situation in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. So that's an awesome story. That's an awesome story. So again, God says, my people would never be put to shame. Let me finish reading this out. We're back still in Job. Let me read 27. And you shall know that I'm in the midst. See that? See what God says to Israel? Listen, I'm going to restore the years that you lost. And you will never be ashamed. And not only that, you're going to know something. You're going to know. It says, and you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel. God said, yeah, we're going through, but I'm going to show up in a way that you're going to know it's me. Amen. Hallelujah. I know God has shown up in some of your lives already. And God have many different ways he show up. He show up through people. God use people. God use saints. So God can even use sinners if he choose to. God shows up in many different ways. So some things might have happened and we've, you know, during this time, but God's shown up. And we need to recognize that it is God Amen. that's causing the good to happen. The Bible tells me in James chapter 1, verse 17, Every good and perfect gift come down from above. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of light, in whom there is no bearableness, neither is there shadow of turning. It means God doesn't change. He's the same all the time. He's good all the time. He blesses us all the time. He don't bring trouble in our life. Our decision, our behavior, our sin can cause the trouble to come. But God is the deliverer. Many are the affliction of the righteous, the scripture says. But the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. So he's the deliverer. Love it. Hallelujah. I hope you are encouraged by this. All right, let me continue. So it says here, and you shall know that I'm in the midst. God said, you're going to know. In the midst of our, tri our trial and our test, God said, you're going to know that I'm in the midst of Israel. I'm in the midst of you. And that I am the Lord your God. And none else. And my people again shall never. He repeats it again. And my people shall never be ashamed. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? That should be encouraging. Hallelujah. That should be encouraging to you this morning. God says, I'm going to cause some things to happen. Some things are going to happen. But I'm going to be in the midst of you. And you're not going to be brought to shame. So I want to encourage you. If you felt shame for any reason along this journey, lift your head up. Look unto him. David said, I will look unto him and be enlightened and my face will not be ashamed. Hallelujah. I believe that's Psalm 27. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his trouble. So look to the Lord this morning and be illuminated, be enlightened, glean from the wisdom of God as to what to do during this time. All right, let me give you a little bit more. Now, we're talking about using our time wisely, and I believe God placed some things in my heart always relevant to 
the time that we're in. So when we think about the title of the message, and again, we're going to go back and forth throughout this message uh, in the chapter in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 20. So we can go back there, and from time to time, I'll probably illuminate some of the things in the chapter that Jesus uh, asked those workers who were standing idle and the responses that the people who were standing idle gave to Jesus. So since we're focusing on how are we using our time, there's some things that I wanted you to understand. Being busy is not a sign of using your time wisely. How are we using our time? You know, folks think because they're busy and doing a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of things, mean that you're using your time wisely. No, busyness is not a sign of using your time wisely. So we need, need to make a sign of that because there are a lot of folks that's busy doing a whole lot of things, but what is it all leading to? What is the end result of being busy? What, what is your sense of accomplishment once you've been busy with a whole lot of things what is the one thing that you could say I specifically accomplished by being busy doing all of these different things? What is the one thing that I could say I've seen the, the result of me, and, me being busy on this particular thing? So being busy is not a sign of using our time wisely. I'm going to teach you and show you how being busy doing the right thing is using your time wisely. All right, let's look at some scriptures real quick. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter number three. So there's a few um, verses I'm gonna give you. So I'm just gonna have to give it to you. You're gonna write them down and hopefully we'll get a chance to go to uh, most of them. All right, so being busy is not a sign of using your time wisely. We can be busy doing the wrong thing. And the Bible talks about that. So let's look at some scriptures concerning uh, busy. And I'm going to show you something concerning Jesus. Jesus was busy too, but Jesus' busyness was focused. So you want to be busy doing the right thing. And I'll show you that in the scripture too. So again, we talked about being busy doing the wrong thing. It's possible to be busy, but busy doing the wrong thing. Second Thessalonians chapter number three. And again, you can read the verses before and after, but for time's sake. I'm just going to kind of give you the verse that I wanted to focus on. So let's look at verse number 11. Chapter 3, verse number 11. Okay, on this one, I'm going to go back to the verse 10. And again, you can go back even further because the whole chapter is great. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's start at verse number 10. It says, for even when we were with you, this is the apostle, Paul, talking to the church of Thessalonica, he says, even when we were with you, we commanded you that if any would not work, should not eat. This was a commandment that the apostle gave to the church, to the believers. And he said, this was a commandment that we gave you when we were with you, that if any would not work, Neither should he eat. So that tells me everyone should be working if you're going to eat. So this is a commandment that the apostle gave to the believers. Anyone who does not work should not eat. Verse number 11. For I, now again, he's talking to the believers, things that were happening actually in the church. All right. He says here in verse number 11, for we heard that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are what? busy bodies so again you can be a, a busy your body can be busy doing the wrong thing so apostle says here to the church of Thessalonica you know that we heard that there's some that's walking disorderly among you not working at all so you are out of order if you're not working and the church said everybody should be working on something everybody should be working on something everybody should be doing something productive and at some point, I may even mention about, uh, I think that's the next thing I put in the PowerPoint, uh, present day. Let me think I'm just going to move to it and see. Okay. All right. So I didn't put it there, but I was going to mention it. I'm going to talk a little bit about present day time. What are we doing during this time? Present day time. What's the things that's going on now? 
What are we working towards? What are we doing? How are we using our time during this time of pandemic? How are we using our time? There's so many that want to go back to a normal way of life. Well, guess what? There's going to be a, a, there's a new norm now. You know, we want to go back to normal. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to bring everything back and trying to bring a normalcy to everything. No, we need to be preparing ourselves for what we're going through now and how can we survive. Forget about trying to go back to being normal. Let's figure out what we need to do during this time to survive. And what is God's plans for us for the future? How do we prepare for the future as opposed to trying to go back to what or how things used to be? So we'll get a chance to talk about that briefly. So we just read here in verse number 11, I hear that there's some that uh, walk among you disorderly, not working at all. So we know that we are out of order if we're not working or working on something productive. And then it says, not working at all, but are busybodies. All right, so there are some who are not working and not doing anything productive with their life but they are busy about it. I mean, they're in everybody's business. And I hope this scripture is not talking about you. Glory to God. And if it is, then we need to make changes. And we need to get busy doing the things of the Lord. So again, a sign of being busy is not a sign of using your time wisely. Because again, you can be busy in the wrong things. So I'm, I'm just showing you a number of scriptures that talks about that. So I gave you that one there. Uh, let's keep moving on. Let's go to 1 Timothy. Let me show you something in 1 Timothy. All right, so it wasn't just in that church at Thessalonica. It was in all the churches. This is the message to all the churches. So now Paul takes this message to uh, young Timothy, who was also a pastor in a different location. And some of the same thing had to be said to those believers over there. And then we're going to see in Peter, Peter in a different location, wherever he was ministering, had to be said to the saints over there. So this message is for everyone. We need to be busy doing the right things. All right, so again, uh, every word be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Uh, First Timothy chapter number five. And let's look at verse number 13. And again, you can go back and read if you can, but for time's sake, again, let me just kind of grab some of the verses that I want and try to get some, as much as I can get in with the time I have left. Verse number 13, First Timothy, Chapter number five, verse 13, it says, and with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but rather also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. So he, again, he's talking about people in the body of Christ who are just wanderers and not using their time wisely. It talks about here in this verse, that they're wandering from house to house and they're idling and they're carrying news and talking about things that they should not be talking about. This should not be said of us. We don't have time to waste in, in gossiping because gossiping is not of God. You don't want to carry bad news and talk about people. We don't have time for that. Don't, don't do the enemy's work. The Bible says Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that go around and accuse us before God and say all kinds of negative things about us before God. Let's not do the enemy work. Okay, so again, we're talking about not being busy. Uh, being busy is not a sign of being of using your time wisely. Let us not be busy in the wrong things, because it's possible to be busy doing the wrong things. Let's look at some other scripture real quick. I told you Jesus was busy, but he was busy doing his father's work. He was about his father's business. So let's look at some scriptures real quick concerning that. Let's go to Luke, the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter number two. Luke chapter number two. And the focus is verse number 49. Like I said, you can read the verses on your own, but for time's sake, we're just kind of giving you the focus verse. Luke chapter number two, look at verse number 49. This is the story when Mary and uh, Joseph was traveling and they were traveling with Jesus with a young child at this time. And they had left the area in which they were that they went to and they left and Jesus stayed behind. And because they were among family while they were traveling, you know, they really wasn't looking back to keep up to see that if Jesus was with them, with all the family, but Jesus wasn't even with the family. He wasn't with the group. And it wasn't until after traveling for a few hours, they realized that Jesus wasn't there. Like, where's Jesus? And this is where we pick it up. Verse number 49. 
And he said unto them, matter of fact, I'll go back so you can see the question. Verse number 48. And when they saw him, they went back and they saw him in the temple. It says, and when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why has, why has thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowly. We don't know what happened to you. We, we thought you were in the group. We were looking for you. And he said unto them, this is what Jesus' response was to his parents. How is it that you sought me? Wish not that I must be about my father's business. He wasn't being disrespectful to his parents, but he was asking them, how is it? Why is it that you, you were seeking me? Why is it that you were looking for me? He said, don't you know I was placed there for a purpose and for a reason? And my purpose is to do the will of my father. My purpose, my meat. He said this in one occasion. He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me while it is day. You know that scripture. It says, because night come and no man can work. So Jesus says, my assignment is to do what God has placed me here to do. So Jesus was busy, but he was doing, busy doing what the father placed him here to do. So again, you want to be busy, but you want to be busy doing what God placed us here to do. So again, being busy doing the wrong thing is not a sign of using your time wisely. Using your time wisely is being busy doing what the father has placed us here to do. So that's what Jesus said. You know, how is it that you sought me? Don't you know I must be about my father's business? And kingdom work is business. You know, many times people think uh, preachers don't work. Listen, we work 24 hours, seven days a week. We're always on the clock. Because people many times are always reaching out to us and asking and needing counseling, needing prayer. There's always something. We're always on the clock. We're always working. All right, so Jesus says here, kingdom business or kingdom work is my father's business. Jesus says, I must be about my father's business. So again, I want you to see here that Jesus was busy, but he was busy doing what the father placed him here to do. Now, let me give you some scripture because there's a whole lot of scriptures that talk about Jesus says, I came to do the will or the work of him that sent me. I quoted that for you while it is day. Jesus says, I'm not here on my own. I'm here by design. I'm here by purpose. And I'm using my time to do what the Father has placed me here to do. So let's look at some scriptures real quick. Let's go now. Uh, let's go to St. John. St. John, let's start at chapter number five, and then we'll, we'll stroll through St. John. We're going to go to chapter five, then chapter eight, and then chapter 10. And just to look at some verses real quick. Because throughout the gospel, Jesus keeps referring back to doing his Father's will. St. John. Chapter number five. This is Jesus talking about, I'm busy, but I'm busy doing my father's work. Verse number 17. It says, but Jesus answered, and again, you have to go back and see what the question was, but because of time's sake, we're not going to go back. Jesus answered them, my father work hitherto, and I work. My father work. So whatever I see my father do and whatever my father tells me to do, that's the kind of work I do. So whatever the father do, the work I see the father do is what I do. So Jesus said, I'm not here, you know, using my time to do what I want to do. I'm doing what the father has commissioned me to do. Whatever I see the father do is what I do. So he says here, my father work hitherto and I work. So whatever I see the father do up until this point, up until this point, I've seen the father work hitherto up until this point. I've seen the father work and whatever I see the father do, that's what I'm doing now here on earth. Therefore, verse 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said God was his father, making himself equal with God. Jesus understood why he was here. He knew who sent him. Even the religious leader didn't understand. They were moving without purpose. They were doing things to be men pleasers, religious leaders. So Jesus moved with purpose. He used his time wisely. Let's keep moving. St. John. Chapter eight this time. And verse number 39. I hope you're getting something out of this. Use our time wisely. And again, go back and read the verses. And maybe the next time we come back together, we'll go back so we can explain it a little bit more in details. But look at verse number 39 real quick. And they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And this is what Jesus talking to his, the Jews because they wanted to stone him. 
because he said he was of God and he was sent by God and that God was his father. And then they said, they, they answered him and said, I said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the work of Abraham because you would have been following Abraham, who you say is your father. And if Abraham was your father, then you will be doing what Abraham did. Abraham was a man of faith and he believed God. Jesus says, I came from God. Why not? Why you don't believe the words that I'm saying? So if you were the descendants of Abraham, you would be like Abraham. Abraham believed God, the Bible says. But then verse 40 says, but you seek to kill me, a man that have told you the truth. And people don't like truth. A man who have told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. So he said, I got my instruction directly from the father. Abraham didn't get it. Abraham sometimes got it in a bush or an angel speaking to him. Jesus said, I spoke directly to the father and got my instructions. So again, we see Jesus at work. Let's look at some other scriptures. And again, there's a whole lot of scriptures that we can validate this point that Jesus was busy doing his father's will. Let me show you another one that's really important. Let's go to, uh, and I think I'll tell you one more. So you, I'm not going to go to that one. That's um, St. John 10, 37. You can read that one. But for time's sake, let's keep moving. Let's go to Acts, the book of Acts. That's the next book after St. John. Acts chapter number 10. And there's like one of two things I want to give you, then I'll sum this up. Acts chapter number 10. And look at verse number 38. It's a powerful verse. 1038, Acts 1038 says this. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. God anointed Jesus to do what he did when he was here on the earth. God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. The scripture that you read in St. Matthew chapter number 10, um, and I think I'll pick up on that the next time we come together. It says the same thing in that verse. So we definitely have to go back to that one and read that. So read that one on your own because that one talks about Jesus went about doing good and it mentioned the different cities that Jesus was going throughout to teach the, to preach the kingdom of God. So that one gave specific details of the places that Jesus went well, to use his time being busy for the kingdom of God. And then this one here kind of did like a general statement by saying, who went about doing good, didn't say where he went, but the gospel of Matthew talks about where he went, the places where he went. All right, Acts says he went about doing good and notice what Jesus did with his time. He was doing his father's will and his father's will was for him to do what? He went around healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. It says he went around doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So Jesus was a, a about busy doing the Father's will, going around healing, delivering folks who are depressed. And the Bible says he did all of those things because God was with him. So Jesus was busy and he was busy doing his Father's business. I wanna give you this last portion of this PowerPoint because there's some things I want you to think about as I bring this message to a close. One of the greatest failure in life is being busy at the wrong thing. One of the greatest failure in life is being busy at the wrong thing. So many people are busy, but busy doing the wrong things. Sila, something to think about. The fundamental key to success is establishing priorities. So again, Many know this, it's a fundamental key. In order to be successful in life, we must learn how to prioritize. It's establishing priorities, it's establishing what is important as opposed to doing a whole lot of things. Focus on what's important if you're gonna be successful. So a fundamental key, one fundamental key to success is establishing priorities. Now, I want to give you like a little assignment. And I, when I come back, I'm going to pick it up right here. I said, I'm going to talk about present day situation. Because what happens is, based on what we're going through now and what we've experienced in these past six months or so with the pandemic, with the civil unrest, with all the stuff that's going on in our nation, 
it caused us to do an assessment of our life and start to think about how we have been using our time. What have we been doing with our life? We have a whole lot, we have had a whole lot of time to really stop and think during this time. Some people have come to realize there's some things that's much more important than just work and work and work and work and work and focus on my career and not thinking about my family. So some have come to realize the importance of family, of spending time with family members during this pandemic. Because a lot of times I know we have to work to survive, but in everything, we got to have balance. You don't want to work so hard and focus on your career to the point you lose your family. Because once you have reached the pinnacle of your uh, achievement, who are you going to have to share it with? When your family is no longer there because you lost them in the process. Sila, something to think about. So this present day situation have caused many to stop and do inventory of our lives. And even think about how we have been using our time. And think about the years that we have put in into relationships and into business transactions, business relationships. What's the benefit? What was the benefit of this all these years? So I wanna close with this. And when we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how present day situation have caused us to reevaluate to, to re how we use our time. Because we certainly need to use our time differently. And we need to start thinking differently as opposed to thinking about, I'm ready to go back to, you know, to, to normal, for things to go back to being normal. Because it's not gonna go back to being normal. Is going to be a, a new normal, a different normal. So now we must learn how to live during what we're experiencing. How do we become successful now during this time? Because one of the things that I've seen, and again, I got something I'm going to give you in the next piece on the PowerPoint that I'm done. In the county that I live in, I see a lot of things closing. A lot of businesses are closing because this is a tough time for a lot of people. A lot of businesses, you've seen it on the news, a lot of businesses want to reopen and they can't reopen because of social distancing laws that have been established and they are suffering and businesses are closing because they are not able to stay afloat during this time. It's causing us to now reevaluate how we use our time. What are we going to do now with our time? What are these businesses, the people who own these businesses, what are they going to do now? Now that their business haven't survived, so now they got to think differently of how they're going to use their time. This is what I want you to do in closing. I want you to list seven things that are important to you. Starting with the most essential. That's a little homework assignment for you. I want you to list seven things that are important to you in your life, starting with that first thing being the most essential. Because it's, it's now time to reevaluate how we're using our time. We should be using our time productively during this time. How do we do that? I'll share with you the next time we come back. One of the ways to do it is tapping into the wisdom of God. Because I'm going to show you the next time we come together that Joseph was in the midst of a famine, but he tapped into God's wisdom. How to be prosperous during the famine. And there are others who have tapped into God's wisdom during troubled times, and they prosper. Mm. So I want you to take the time during this week and consider these things, the seven things. And it could be more than seven. Initially, I thought about 10, but then I used the number seven because seven is the number of completion. So I really want you to think about it before you jot it down. And even if you jot it down and it's not prioritized like, you, like they should be, then reprioritize the list but start with the thing that is most important what's most important right now during this time all right and i can help you i can throw some stuff out for you real quick as we end some of the things that can be on your list what's my relationship like with the father god that should be at the top of the list how do i stand with god how do i stand what is my relationship like is my name written in the land's book of life so there's a number of things that we can consider in this list. So I just jot down a few things here that you may want to consider. 
What's my relationship like with the Father God? How will I provide for myself and my family during this time? Or during the next few months, because it's, it's a possibility that now we're moving towards the colder weather, flu season mixed with corona. What is that going to lead to? So we're going to deal with this because I like talking about present day situation and, and encouraging the people of God on what we should be doing. So again, I close with this. What's your relationship like with God? And these are some things that you can consider. How will I provide for myself and my family during this time and even in the future with what is to come? What do I have in store that can prepare me for the difficult times ahead? What's in store? Have you been preparing yourself? Have you noticed now certain things are, are hard to purchase? You know, you try to go buy a freezer, try to buy generators. Certain things are hard to find now. Why? Everybody bought them up. What do you have in store that will prepare you if it gets worse? Don't wait. Use your time wisely. And the last thing I'll throw out is this. What can I do to assist others? What can I do to help others? How can I use my time? If I'm straight and my things, you know, I got my stuff together, what can I do to assist others? What can I do to be a blessing? And there's just a few things that the Lord put in my heart. But again, whatever God placed in your heart, you jot down those things, starting with the most important to you. And then it'll help you to evaluate how you use your time. I hope you got something out of the message today. And when we come back next week, we'll continue along this line because I do love teaching the word of God and making it relevant to where we are today. God's word is not some antiquated book that doesn't deal with present day situation. God's word is alive and well, and it works in every season, every dispensation, the word works. So if you're listening to me for the first time and you do not know the Lord Jesus and the pardon of your sins, and you may say, hey, pastor, I have not used my time wisely. I mean, I've done some things you know, in my early years and even in the years that I'm in now, I have not made wise, wise decisions. Well, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can turn your life around. It's very simple. The Bible says that you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved. So say this prayer with me. Say, Father, I believe that you are God. Jesus Christ is your son. You sent him to die on the cross for my sins. You raised him from the dead for my justification. I repent. I turn away from my past ways. And I receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for my salvation, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you made that confession for the very first time, you have just received Jesus as Lord into your life. I say congratulations and I say welcome to the family of God. Please write us, um, you know, text it in the address box. Let us know that you received Jesus as your Lord so that we can get some information to you um, on your next step in salvation so that you can grow in your walk with the Lord. This is only the beginning of your salvation. God has so much more in store for you and we want to help you along this journey. Some, someone help us and help us to become who we are in Christ Jesus. And we want to do our part to help you and to communicate with you that which we have learned, like the scripture have instructed us today that we read. We want to communicate that which we have learned to you to help you grow in your faith in the Lord. Well, God bless you. Until next time, remember, God is on the throne, Jesus is Lord, and the devil is defeated. God bless.